Thank you very much once again. So this is, was a five-year effort to make this trial uh, from the beginning to the results. So it was a great pleasure to present the results today. Uh, my name is Fernando Zampieri. I'm an critical care physician from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, the basics trial was sponsored by the Minister of Healthcare in Brazil. Uh, it was conducted by HCOR together with the BRIC Net, with the Brazilian Research and Intensive Care Network. And we are very proud to be here today. Uh, of course, the trial also received some logistics uh, support for the fluids and logistics from Baxter Hospital uh, in Brazil, which was not involved in trial design, data collection, analysis, and manuscript collaboration, et cetera. And we are very thankful for all the efforts that uh, patients and their families, it's all about them, and trial sites and age core team uh, put to make this trial come true. So this is a really great achievement. And I finally would like to thank the network uh, for doing such amazing job. And so uh, it was a very large trial and we were able to do that despite of all adversity. So we are, I'm very thankful for being part of it and for being entrusted to present the results today. The screening committee is on the screen. Uh, I have some uh, conflicts of interest that are uh, uh, presented below, mostly for investigator initiated trials from industry and uh, public funding. And uh, this presentation is divided in three parts. So I'm going through background and methods for the basics trial. Then Alexandre will present the results. And in the end of the session, I'm going to discuss a little bit what we learned uh, when we did a, such a large trial. Okay, so for the background on methods. So uh, both the study protocol and the study uh, statistical analysis plan have been published before. They have been published uh, the, the protocol paper three years ago and uh, statistical analysis plan earlier this year. So they are already free, freely available. But mostly, uh, of course, uh, the question on whether balanced solutions may be helpful for critically ill patients, it remains open, right? So uh, we have some data that suggests that it can be related to, can, be, can cause lower mortality and lower acute kidney injury occurrence, uh, but we are actually not that sure, uh, as we will discuss today. Uh, and of course, the idea uh, in this trial was to check another aspect of fluid use that we frequently not consider in other trials, which is the infusion rate or how fast the fluids are infused in the patient's veins. Uh, regarding the first uh, arm of the trial, we had some evidence from uh, the split trial that was neutral. Uh, the trial compared uh, buffered crystalloids versus saline for, and the primary endpoint was need for under replacement therapy. It was a neutral trial. But we also had a very large uh, trial, a cluster randomized trial from Vanderbilt, from Matthew Sandler and team, uh, where they checked whether balanced solutions would improve a composite endpoint of acute kidney injury, uh, need for renal replacement therapy, and mortality up to 30 days. And this trial was positive for a reduction in the composite endpoint. So evidence was still uh, not complete, let's say. So we needed yet another trial to check whether this uh, was uh, generalized well to uh, other settings and not only to one scenario. Uh, we did a meta-analysis for the trial that uh, included all the recent trials and uh, this meta-analysis that contributed to the equipoise for this. And we have this meta-analysis from Cochrane too that also contributed to the equipoise uh, for the basics trial. And regarding the second aspect of the basics trial is infusion speed. So, uh, this was mostly based on uh, Dr. Maitland's paper uh, in the FEAST trial, where uh, food bolus were associated with uh, worse outcomes in critically ill septic children. And when we discussed the basics trial, we thought that perhaps we should consider a second arm uh, where the infusion speed should be uh, assessed inside a randomized uh, trial. We know that uh, slower infusion speeds are probably, or physiologically, they are more related to a prolonged or greater uh, endovascular uh, expansion. And uh, it can also reduce uh, tissue edema and perhaps reduce organ function. So we have some evidence that, for example, if you give two liters of saline to healthy volunteers, you're going to decrease oxygenation and reduce exercise tolerance. And we also have some evidence that uh, on, on, on septic patients, that when you give fluid to a patient, you may uh, actually decrease after load uh, through a decrease in arterial elastance that could be related to uh, non uh, to uh, lower blood pressure and and perhaps different outcomes in in those populations. So uh, both questions are probably very relevant and they are they are part of the everyday job 
for all critically uh, ill physicians and uh, nurses and respiratory therapists. We were especially uh, interested in this secondary analysis of the FIST trial where uh, the food bowls was associated with perhaps uh, more cardiovascular collapse in, in, in septic children. So we thought a lot about this when we designed the trial. So BASICS was mostly a, a factorial randomized multicenter trial in 75 ICUs in Brazil. We plan to randomize 11,000 patients to either a plasma light, 148, or a normal saline, 0.9% saline, and uh, in a factorial way to two different infusion speeds when patients needed food challenges. So one was 999 because that's the fastest most infusion pumps in Brazil go, and because that would result in uh, 500 ml over half an hour, which is the average food bowls, uh, as by the Finney's uh, study by Mauricio Ciccone. Uh, and we uh, set up uh, this lower infusion rate as a third of the uh, control of the counter infusion rate because that would be an infusion speed that would also be considered fluid bolus by most physicians, but was not simply a maintenance uh, fluid therapy. Uh, the, the, the trial was, of course, it was randomized, it was blinded for the fluid type, but it was not blinded for the infusion speeds. And blinding was made by uh, bags uh, labored A to F. Uh, that were provided to the site. So patients could be randomized, for example, to receive letter B fast or letter C slow, uh, et cetera. So all the possible combinations between the letters and the infusion speed. We included all critically ill patients that required at least one fluid uh, expansion at the discretion of the attending physicians, uh, patients that were not expected to be discharged the, day, uh, the next day after enrollment, uh, and patients that had at least one risk factor for uh, acute kidney, kidney injury or mortality, uh, age uh, above 65, hypotension, uh, presence of sepsis, need for mechanical ventilation or non-invasive ventilation for more than 12 hours, abnormal renal function, uh, or previous diagnosis of liver uh, cirrhosis or acute liver failure. So we, we, we got those criteria by querying some large data sets in, uh, we had in Brazil in the orchestra study, and we uh, selected these uh, risk factors to get an expected mortality that would reflect uh, our power calculations. We excluded patients that were already on renal replacement therapy, uh, regardless of whether chronic renal replacement therapy at home or in the hospital, or patients that were expected to require renal replacement therapy within the next six hours after uh, ICU admission. We excluded patients that ha had severe electrolyte disturbance, like very low or very high uh, sodium levels. Patients uh, whose death was considered uh, imminent and inevitable within the next 24 hours, patients with suspected or confirmed brain death, patients receiving palliative care only, and patients that were already enrolled in the trial. So this is the main diagram of, of how the intervention worked in basic. So, the attending physician indicated fluid expansion, uh, for example. So if it was a fluid challenge, then the patient should re re uh, receive uh, the required set amount by the physician uh, at the design and infusion speed. So if he said, uh, or if he, they said uh, 500 ml, uh, then it could be in this speed for the zone infusion or in this speed uh, if the patient was randomized to a, a contrary infusion rate. For maintenance, uh, the, all maintenance was also requested to be done in the studio fluid, uh, but at the design and speed uh, by the attending physician, like one liter a day, two liters a day or something. And other fluids were free, like bicarbonate, albumin, blood, colloids, et cetera, as needed. Regarding dilution, so we also asked the size to dilute everything that was compatible with both saline and plasma light at the, the, the specific uh, letter of the study fluid. So uh, this was valid only for dilutions that were above 100 ml. Uh, if it was below uh, or, or up to 100 ml, the sites were free to infuse uh, at their usual care. Uh, we asked them to use glucose as a preferred fluid uh, whenever possible. But if it was compatible with both fluids, then uh, it was diluted in the allocated study fluid. So we did this to increase uh, how much uh, the, of the percentage of fluids that the patient would receive that would be uh, the study fluids, right? So this was to avoid or reduce contamination. We knew that some contamination would be, uh, in, uh, would occur in a way, but we did that to uh, make patients receive 
the, uh, as much as possible these 2D fluids. So this was how the fluids looked like. So it's written group D here. So uh, it, we had six letters and uh, Baxter supplied uh, boxes for, for the sites. So uh, each site had received uh, up to uh, two boxes with 15 liters each for each fluid letter. So uh, all sites received at least one batch of all possible letters. And, and that require a lot of uh, you know, organization and, and logistics support because we had to make sure that one site would not run out of fluids uh, when they were enrolling patients, right? So uh, this was, uh, the, it was visually identical. So it was just written the group here. It was visually identical. The primary endpoint was 90 day survivor. It was assessed uh, centrally at age four by a dedicated team who had a lot of work. Uh, if the phone calls were unsuccessful, we did everything we could to obtain the primary endpoint, which was mortality. Uh, including uh, hostile returns, whether the patients got a blood sample drawn in a given time. We sent telegrams. Sometimes we send personnel at, at some patients' houses to check on them. And when everything failed, we use uh, the, the National Database of Disease uh, by uh, the Brazilian Ministry of Health. Our secondary endpoints include a need for renal replacement therapy up to 90 days, occurring of, occurrence of acute kidney injury uh, defined as a cadigo uh, two or three within days three and seven. And SofaScore and its components also on day three and seven, we decodomize SofaScore to higher or lower than two uh, for some secondary analysis and mechanical ventilation three days at 28 days. So the primary endpoint analysis was uh, evaluated by a frailty survival model, which was adjusted by age. Uh, the SofaScore at enrollment admission type and enrolling site as a, a random intercept for that. And as admission type, it was planned admission, unplanned admission with sepsis, and unplanned admission without sepsis. We had several subgroup analysis that uh, Alexandra is going to show the results, but mostly uh, patients with or without sepsis, with or without acute kidney injury in the background, surgical and non-surgical patients, TBI or non-TBI, patients with high or low opacity score, and whether the patients received more or less than one liter of saline before enrollment. So this trial, uh, the power calculation was made. So we had a 89% power to detect a reduction in 90-day mortality from 35 to 31.5%. So that would be a hazard of 0.9 or less for 90-day mortality with an alpha value of 0.05. So I believe that that was my my part of the presentation. So I'm very happy to pass the word to Alexandre. So Alexandre now is going to present the results of the trial. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Alexandre Bias Cavalcanti. Then I'm going to present the results of basics. I will start by presenting the results uh, on the comparison balance solution versus 0.9% saline, followed by the comparison between uh, fluid rates. So uh, a total of 11,052 patients were randomized in the study. Uh, patients were uh, basically uh, randomized to the four following groups, patients with the balance solution and flow infusion, patients in the group with balance solution and the uh, Slower the faster infusion, the control infusion, patients are receiving saline and the slower infusion, and patients receiving saline and the control infusion. Uh, a number uh, of patients were excluded after randomization, mostly because uh, consent was um, withdrawn. Uh, we had uh, we used. Uh, deferred consent in this study, patients could be randomized in the trial, and uh, whenever they recovered, consent was uh, uh, was asked for the patients. In some cases, uh, there were uh, refusal, so there were 124, uh, 139 patients excluded in the group of balanced solutions low infusion, 153 excluded in the balanced solution control infusion, 123 in the saline slow infusion and 117 in the saline and control infusion. 
When we consider uh, all the groups, the groups that received the balanced solution, we have uh, 15 patients lost to 90 day follow up, although 12 of those uh, were uh, followed up to uh, hospital discharge. So we have data. Uh, we consider the data at the hospital discharge and three without follow up for those we have uh, data imputed. Uh, in the in the saline group, we have 10 patients lost to 90-day follow-up, three with uh, data available at hospital discharge. So use the sensor data and seven whose data had to be uh, inputted. So uh, we have then uh, 5,230 patients uh, included in the analysis for the primary outcome in the balanced solution group and 5,290 patients included in the analysis for the saline group. These are the baseline characteristics of the patients. Uh, they are basically uh, very well balanced between groups. Uh, age of the patients uh, was 61 uh, years old in both groups. Female sex was 44% in both groups. Uh, in both groups, the number of patients uh, they're going elective surgery was 47.8 and 49%, non-elective surgery 12.5%, the balanced solution group and 12.3 in the same group. And uh, medical patients were 39.7 in the balanced solution group and 38.6 in the saline group. So for score uh, was a, a, the median so for score was four in both groups. Uh, around one third of patients had uh, KD go acute kidney injury score of one or more. 18.5% of patients had sepsis at the baseline in the balanced solution group and 19% in the saline group. 4.7 and 4.5 were uh, traumatic brain injury at the baseline and 60.7% and 6.5 had hypotension at the baseline and 44% were on invasive mechanical ventilation at baseline. Here we can see uh, uh, how uh, was the use of other solutions where uh, while the patients were uh, at, in the emergency room or operating room before they were randomized. So in the 24 hours before randomization, you can see that 48% of the patients in both groups Received some received any uh, balanced solution, and 31% uh, of the patients received more than one liter of balanced solution. Regarding use of 0.9% saline before randomization in the 24 hour before randomization, you can see that 38% and 37% of patients the balanced solution saline group respectively received uh, uh, saline and. Uh, 17.9 and 18.8 received more than one liter before randomization. Uh, here you can see the, the volume of infused fluids by group on days one, two, three, and day seven. Uh, most uh, day one patients received a little bit more than two liters uh, median uh, fluid in that day, and most of it was study fluid in red, the rest being open crystalloids and uh, other fluids. Uh, this was similar between groups. And of course, the amount of fluids decreased as the day, in days two, three, and, and so on, as we, we expect. Anyway, most of the fluids used were the study fluids. In total, patients used 1.5 liters of study fluid on, on day one and from day one to day three, 2.9 liters. This resulted in differences in serum chloride levels, uh, so that in patients that received 0.9% saline, serum chloride levels increased as compared to the balanced solution group. And uh, the difference was about two milliequivalents per liter uh, along the days. Here we have the results for the primary endpoint. 90-day mortality was very similar between the, the two groups, 26.4 uh, 
the balance solution group as compared to 27.2 in the saline group. Uh, the survival curves, as you can see, very similar. Uh, has a rate of 0.97 with a 95% confidence interval of 0.90 to 1.05 and a known significant p value of 0.47. There were also no differences for most of the secondary endpoints we assessed. Uh, acute skin injury with need for renal replacement therapy within the first 90 days uh, was uh, very similar between groups. The rate of uh, need for renal replacement therapy was 0.88 per 1,000 patients day in the balanced solution group as compared to 0.93. Uh, the incidence of acute kidney injury as measured by a KD goal of two or higher at day three and seven was very similar between uh, treatment groups. We also measured other components of the SOFA score on day three and day seven. Uh, the incidence of elevation of these components of SOFA score uh, higher than, than two was similar between groups for most components of SOFA score, except maybe for in the, in the, on day three, that uh, um, SOFA score higher than two was slightly more frequent in the balanced solution group. This, this effect disappeared on day seven. However, on day seven, we can see here that uh, abnormal neurological SOFA score or higher than two was slightly more frequent in the balanced solution group. No other differences for the other components of the score. And of course, we have to acknowledge here that there are multiple outcomes and, and we are not adjusting uh, the size of confidence intervals for, for these multiple analysis. Regarding the subgroup analysis, we can see that the effect of balanced solution versus saline on mortality was similar across subgroups, except for the subgroup of patients with traumatic brain injury. Uh, as you can see, we had uh, a little bit more than 400 patients with, uh, with traumatic brain injury. And among these patients, mortality was 31% for those who received balanced solution versus 21% for those who received saline. Uh, hazard ratio was 1.48. And the p-value for interaction was significant as 0.02, suggesting harm of using a um, balanced solution for those patients. Now for the results of the slower versus faster IV fluid boluses. The flow of patients was basically similar. Uh, we had uh, 5,276 uh, patients included in the primary outcome analysis for the slower infusion group and 5,244 patients included in the analysis for the, uh, the faster uh, infusion group, the control infusion group. So uh, I'll take over from where uh, Alexandre left. So, um, so we, for, uh, regarding infusion speed, we had uh, the same amount of patients randomized. We had uh, a very good uh, distribution among the groups. We lost around 14 patients uh, follow up for uh, the slow infusion speed and 11 patients for uh, the fastest or the contour infusion speed. And we had some patients that were censored at hospital discharge, but we missed it. And the primary endpoint was missing in, in, in 10 patients that were imputed for the primary endpoint. So there are uh, no, no big surprises in table one here too. So uh, both uh, groups were, were similar regarding the major features regarding SOFA, CADIGO, recurrence of sepsis, TBI, hypotension, et cetera. So there's nothing uh, that uh, is much in, that brings you uh, some, don't feel impressed by this. Uh, regarding the fluid use, uh, on day one, around 75% of all fluids that were infused were infused, infused as uh, a bolus infusion, right? So uh, then, uh, then over time, the proportion of fluids that was uh, in, infused as a bolus decreased, but in the first day we had around 75%, then, then around 50%, then 38%. Uh, 
And also we had around 20% of fluids that were infused as maintenance fluids in the first day, then 34 or 35 in the second day. And then this percentage increased on day three and day seven. And other fluids that were infused around 6% on other diffusion speeds. So most of uh, addition was pretty good uh, in the trial. So around over 97% of all patients uh, required and used a fluid bolus, which was one of the inclusion criteria. And in day one, two, and three, uh, the vast majority of patients that received that, that required a fluid bolus uh, received the fluid bolus at the allocated rate. So uh, the risk was pretty good uh, in all, all the arms. And for the primary result, we also uh, reached a neutral result for 90 days mortality. So uh, mortality was 26.6% uh, for slower infusion and 27% for uh, faster infusion rates. And that resulted in a hazard ratio that is uh, very well distributed around the no effect with a p-value of 0.46. Regarding, uh, there was no difference across uh, all the several subgroups we checked. Uh, there was also no signal of harm or benefit for uh, most secondary endpoints. So regarding renal replacement therapy, we, uh, it was also neutral. So no difference in the uh, rate ratio for uh, AKI needing renal replacement therapy. Uh, KD go uh, uh, above two at days three and seven, et cetera. And we had, of course, uh, in the similarly to the flu type, we had uh, some secondary endpoints that were slightly different between groups. Of course, we have to acknowledge the multiple comparison, as Alexandre said, but uh, we had uh, <coughs> a lower number of patients requiring vasopressors at day three uh, in the slow infusion rate that resulted in adjusted odds of 0 0.09, 0 0.89, sorry. Uh, and we have more patients, uh, less patients that had uh, respiratory sofa both three, that is uh, mechanically ventilated patients with a low PF ratio in the slower infusion speed. On the other hand, uh, the abnormal coagulation sofa at day three was slightly higher in the slower uh, infusion group than in the control group. But all these differences, they vanished uh, in day seven. And of course, they are not uh, patient center endpoints for, for what is worth. Uh, but they bring up some interesting discussion, I hope, for the panel. Of course, uh, this trial uh, has several limitations. So we did not, uh, uh, user fluids was limited to the ICU. And while we collected data on user fluids in the emergency room or operating room, that was not considered. And some patients arrived in the ICU after receiving a significant amount of fluids. Uh, we also allowed dilutions that were lower than 100 ml to uh, be uh, on open fluid. So that results in uh, some degree of contamination. We had some uh, pause randomization exclusion, mostly due to lack of consent. Uh, we have no physiological data that what happens, except for one very interesting sub-study that Fabio Machado is leading uh, on what triggered fluid bogus and what happened with the fluid bogus. And of course, the patients received a, a, what might be considered a low, a low volume of fluids uh, during uh, their ICU stay, well, which is uh, similar to the clinical practice. Uh, just to remember the SMART trial, we had around two liters in the first three days, and that's uh, pretty similar to what we had here. So uh, in conclusion, among patients in, in the ICU that required, required fluid challenges, the use of uh, balanced solutions or 0.9% uh, or, uh, saline did not reduce 90 days, 90 day mortality. Uh, we have a very, of course, uh, uh, in all the secondary endpoints and other subgroup analysis, one thing that we should keep in mind is that there is a signal for harm for TBI patients. And for the infusion uh, rate, we could not find a difference uh, in 90 days mortality for a lower infusion rate versus a faster infusion rate. Well, uh, with that, so uh, I believe that I end my presentation now. Uh, Alexandre, if you want to take over. I guess Alexandre is not here. He is just coming back into the meeting, okay. I think. Here he is. Uh, he'll be with us in just a moment. But uh, Fernando and Alexandre and the entire team at Basings, congratulations. What a huge achievement uh, to design and execute that trial and especially finish it under such difficult circumstances during the pandemic.
Alexandre, hopefully you were able to hear the end of Fernando's uh, talk there. He was just handing back over to you. I think maybe you have a concluding remark. So in conclusion, I think uh, Fernando has commented on the limitations of the trial and uh, we can and conclude that uh, among these ICU patients requiring food challenges, use of a balanced solution compared to 9%, 0.9% saline solution to the mortality. And uh, there was a sign, a sign of possible harm for traumatic brain injury patients with the use of a balanced solution. Infusion of crystalloids at a slower rate also did not reduce 90-day mortality. Therefore, these findings do not support either the use of a balanced solution as compared to saline or as slower as compared to a faster infusion rate. Uh, I'd like to, to tell you, and we are very happy that the results of uh, the trial have been published uh, today. Friend can change the slide in, in, in JAMA, both the, the, the comparison of balanced solution with saline and also the paper comparing is lower versus a faster infusion are available for, for you to read. And with that, I finish and thank, uh, thank you. Thank you everyone. And thanks Fernando also for, for your support here in this end of the presentation. My, my pleasure, my pleasure, my absolute pleasure. And please Rob, uh, thank you. Alexandre, thank you very much. And indeed, as Alexandre said, the paper Papers are just out uh, on the JAMA website, and my thanks to JAMA um, for coordinating the publication of these trials with this live stream. It's great to be able to do this and get both out together. So all the information is there, the supplemental data that I'm sure our viewers will want to get into and read. So it's with great pleasure now that I'll hand over to Sydney and Simon Finfer. Simon is the lead investigator for the PLUS trial, which is a similar trial to this so it will be fascinating to hear his thoughts and hopefully we might be able to bring you the plus trial results as a live stream later on in the year so simon early morning over in sydney thanks again for getting up over to you okay well before i um summarize my entire feelings about this trial with one word i'd just like to also to obviously congratulate britnet alexandre fernando flavia and all those wonderful people who've done this extraordinary trial. Uh, also, Rob, for continuing to run this extraordinary resource for the critical care community, which is pretty unique and incredibly valuable for our specialty, particularly um, as um, we're unable to get together physically in, in these uh, dreadful times that we're living in. So really, that is an extraordinary trial. Um, it's great to see it's published today. It's freely available online. Um, and it's my pleasure to uh, make a few comments about it. Um, I'll start just by uh, my disclosures in relation, obviously I've been involved in fluid research for, for many years now, and I have received, um, I don't, haven't taken any money personally from any of these companies, but the CSL, Fresenius, Carby, and Baxter have um, funded travel ac for academic reasons for me and research funding, all of which has been uh, given to my employer, either the George Institute or University of Sydney. Um, as Rob has said, I've also leading a, a large trial, which is very similar to um, the fluid type component of uh, basics. Um, and we are, we have actually coordinated our data collection and endpoints, et cetera, so that we'll be able to put those trials together at the end of the day and provide some pretty um, compelling data, I hope. So the background I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not going to go into in a great detail, but uh, obviously we, I think we all know why we're here. Um, there's a, there's a group of people who don't like saline. Um, who like to refer to it as abnormal saline and uh, have told us of all its ill effects over time. And probably the strongest um, evidence, trial evidence in support of 
those uh, contentions comes from the SMART study, which again was an extraordinarily good and well-run trial. And you've already heard about the, um, the outcome, the primary outcome the measure from that, which was a composite of death, new renal replacement therapy and doubling of serum creatinine concentration, which uh, produced a just statistically significant result in favor of using a balanced crystalloid. And um, Naomi Hammond led uh, a, a observational study, international observational study across um, several hundred intensive care units across the world, uh, demonstrating or reporting that the use of balanced salt solutions had increased significantly um, over a period of uh, about seven years from when we had done a study, uh, a similar observational study after the, the SAFE study. So the, the, there's been a practice change moving away from the use of saline um, to use of more balanced salt solutions. Um, so it's great that we now got from BrickNet some better data to tell us uh, whether this is a good thing or not. Um, I do feel my initial reaction of wow um, kind of summarizes my feeling about this trial, but um, of course we have to be try and be a little bit more um, systematic about how we look at uh, data. And I usually go back to this, what's now might be viewed as a very, very old paper, but I think it's still a very good paper about look at what features should we look at when we read a clinical trial to decide um, the most important thing is, will the results help me in caring for my patients? Because clearly not all randomized controlled trials do produce the least biased uh, evidence for us, but not all randomized controls are, are kind of, uh, created equal. And you can have some serious methodological issues and you can produce results that are misleading um, and that can result in patient harm. So to look at some of these issues quickly, um, the eligibility criteria, um, I don't think you know, one has any particular issues with that. Um, the selection of patients who are going to be in the ICU um, the day after tomorrow effectively, I think is very sensible. Um, clearly, we would like to see a decent exposure to the study interventions. If, if patients are only getting, um, are staying in the ICU for a very short period of time and getting very little fluid, um, then despite the numbers, um, we might think that there are some issues about whether the exposure to the interventions have been significant enough to give us a true result. One of the most important a randomization in a big trial like this, one would expect to see balance between the two groups, but really the feature of randomization that's most important is allocation concealment, that the investigators don't know which group the patients are gonna go into until they have actually been included into the trial and they're going to be tracked. And that certainly was done in basics. It's very important, uh, prevents people from, we can all look at, two patients who look reasonably similar on paper, if you're an experienced uh, intensive care clinician and know that one of them has got a much better chance of survival than the other. And if you, if you then uh, know which group the patients are gonna go into, you can game the recruitment a bit. So this, the allocation process I think was, was very good. Um, you can argue a teeny bit about whether you have fixed lock sizes, but I think it, you know, it's stated in the papers that the sites didn't know the block sizes, um, so I'm not concerned about that. Um, blinding is really important, and it's especially important, I think, in, in, in fluid trials, because we all have our own biases. Um, and so knowing, knowing or not knowing which fluids a patient is getting is, is important. Um, it's important that, as I say, we there are subtle things that happen uh, when we allow our biases to interfere with what how we're treating patients. It sounds like it shouldn't happen, uh, but there's a long uh, 
um, history and critical care research of single centre unblinded trials producing results that can't be replicated in, in multi-centre blinded trials. Um, so I think that's a really important thing. It's important that patients are treated equally in all other fashions and in the, with a sample size of 11,000 and everything else left to the treating clinicians, it's extremely unlikely that there would be imbalances in, in other aspects of treatment that could explain, uh, in this case, why something that should have been a positive result um, turned out to be a neutral result for whichever fluid you consider. Um, it's important that the statistical analysis plan is published beforehand, as was done, because otherwise, obviously, uh, if you can, you know, data trawling through the data until you find something you like and publishing that used to be a common occurrence and hopefully is something of the past. Um, and large sample size um, with a, you know, reasonable uh, reduction, a reasonable hazard ratio, um, rather than looking for a very unrealistic um, uh, treatment effect. Uh, the numbers lost to spot to follow up are very small. I, I guess one thing we might like to know is how many of the patients follow up came from the national database rather than from individually uh, knowing. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe the Brazilian database is much better than the Australian one, but you can't. No, nobody gets into to our death data. Um, for months and sometimes years after they die. So that, that, that is a potential source of error. And the loss to follow up, up, up rate is, is quite extraordinarily low. Um, that, that's really quite remarkable. But again, might like to know how many came from the national database. So do the patients sound similar to the patients that I treat, which would be something I would would look at if I'm deciding whether to allow this to change my treatment. Um, the traditional ICU trial has patients who are aged around about 60 and 60% 60 male, which, which uh, BASICS has. Half the patients had elective surgery. Um, and again, um, we this, this I think is a, a feature of that varies nation to nation. Australia is very well supplied with intensive care beds. Um, you can get into one of our ICUs with relatively minor comorbidities, and most of our elective surgery patients we would would discharge the next day. So, uh, so I, I guess I was a little surprised that it was half of the elective surgical patients that you're not expecting to discharge the next day. But again, that may reflect differences in in national practices. I think the median I, Apache two score was was relatively low again for a population that you're expecting to stay for a couple of days um, and obviously only half were ventilated um, so for, so in terms of severity of illness probably possibly a little bit less than I thought it might be what about exposure and contamination which uh, Alexandre and, and Fernando have alluded to I think that the exposure to study fluid is good um, it's it's better than um, than was seen in, in certainly in terms of medians. It's better than was seen in smart or, or more exposure. Um, there is always going to be some contamination, and as you can see from this this uh, graph, I think the amount to think that it could could um, completely obscure the, any treatment effect from one fluid versus another it seems unlikely to me. The chlorine, uh, which is supposed to be the mechanism by which normal saline is harmful. Again, this, this is quite a similar, if you look at the left-hand panel, which you've already seen, um, it's quite similar to, uh, was seen in, in SMART. In fact, I think a little bit, the, the maximum difference in serum chloride concentration slightly more um, in basics and uh, the, the box and whiskers plot next door, which, which has the, the median, the interquartile range and the range is, is interesting in that it shows you the, the, the degree of overlap, um, even though the means are quite different. And I think that um, you would see exactly the same thing from the SMART data, which does make us wonder whether 
that bit mean difference, which looks quite impressive, especially with a truncated y-axis, is actually reflecting something that would um, one would expect to change significant outcomes for patients. Um, again, the in terms of the the exposure and the contaminant, I was very interested here when I looked at this. The maintenance fluids is basically um, on day one. Uh, it's 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 like ten mils an hour. Now that we we looked at that we've looked at that in our previous large fluid trials, safe and chess, and looked at uh, we found that actually far more in those studies. Um, and also in some point prevalence work we've done, maintenance fluids were much by far the biggest volumes of fluid. And the volumes of fluid that our patients get were more through maintenance fluid and drug delivery than they were through boluses. So that's, that's, uh, that maybe is something that uh, Alexandre or Fernando would comment on where the Brazilian practice is to be quite restrictive about maintenance fluids, um, because certainly that would be a lot less than I would expect to see. You've already seen the result, and I think what's the pre how precise is this estimate? So the the ninety five percent confidence intervals from 0.9 to one point oh five. Um, obviously, there's a reasonable good sample size and a reasonable event rate, so that's pretty impressive. And the same for the for the speed. Um, and it's pretty hard to argue with that. There is this one subgroup effect um, where there's a significant um, treatment effect. Patients with traumatic brain injury is significantly different from the treatment effect with patients without traumatic brain injury. Um, in plus, I mean, we've published our protocol and statistical analysis plans. I'm not this is freely available information. We've excluded patients with traumatic brain injury from PLUS because we thought that possibly plasma light, uh, which is the, the balanced solution used in both these trials, could be harmful in patients with traumatic brain injury. This was based on one very small trial published in Critical Care in 2013 by Rochelle et al. from uh, France. It was only a 40 patient trial and they reported that using a, um, a balanced salt solution, which is a lower tonicity than saline, didn't affect ICP. But if you, because the trial was only 40 patients, statistically it wasn't different. But if you actually look at the graph of the ICP in that paper, immediately following a bolus of the uh, balanced salt solution, the ICP increased 10 millimeters of mercury on average above that seen in patients who got saline. And Ronaldo Belomo has done some very nice work looking at albumin. If you put albumin in saline, you don't see any effect on ICP in animals. If you put, if you infuse it in its usual slightly hypotonic in, uh, fluid, you do see an increase in ICP. So I think there's a, to me that that is um, that has face validity that actually saline is better in those patients. Um, they, there are some sensitivity analyses which are, which are in the um, supplements that are available um, online with the paper, looking at uh, things like whether you, if you look at just the people who didn't get fluid before enrollment, does it affect uh, the difference? Does the baseline serum chloride um, have a different, make a difference to the treatment effect? What about people who did or didn't have kidney injury? And I think the interesting thing here is, is, is this one where I think, you know, there are many comparisons uh, and, and we haven't really had any comment about multiple comparisons that you expect something to come out as significant when you do so many comparisons and, and, and really there isn't anything there. Um, is there anything I don't like? Not really. Um, I sort of thought very hard, um, and I, these are trivial, I think, minor or trivial points. I mean, my, my, my preference is not, in a trial of this size, would be to have a primary outcome that was not adjusted, that was landmark, landmark mortality without imputation of missing values. But these are really, really trivial points. Um, 
I guess the conclusion that that's in the paper, published papers that that um, the balance balanced salt solution isn't indicated. I, I'm probably getting the wording wrong, but we can discuss. Um, I mean, um, I, I think the answer to me is that they're both, you know, you could probably use both apart from in both or either. Um, and also the conclusion in the paper that the um, slower infusion rate isn't indicated. Well, um, there's not really evidence that either uh, that using a faster infusion rate is better. Um, so again, I think that's a, and that's a unique feature of this trial. I think that's what's really important and interesting that people think at, about other aspects of how we use fluids rather than just which particular type of bag we're hanging up. Um, will it help me care for my patients? Well, the population I've, I've mentioned, apart from the maintenance fluid, I think, um, and that most being given as boluses, it's just, I recognize the population. These seem to be very like the patients uh, that I treat. I did not expect the overall result. I was, I'm not, you know, I, I have uncertainty about the, um, the choice of fluid, which is why we're doing the PLUS study, um, but I'm very happy to accept it. I I'm, think that there's no signal for renal injury uh, is a little surprising. Uh, it confirms my bias about patients with traumatic brain injury. So, of course, I'm very happy about that because we love having our biases confirmed. Um, maybe um, I think what I see a lot in practice um, where people are picking fluids based on blood tests and biochemical parameters, um, it, it may not help your patients, but it probably won't harm one. And obviously the rate of infusion doesn't seem to have a strong effect. Um, in this study. So in summary, I think it's an extraordinary achievement. We have to congratulate everyone. As we know, Brazil has been hit very, very hard uh, by the pandemic. Um, I'm not sure that I would um, want to import their president to run my country. Um, but uh, to, do, to achieve this in normal times is extraordinary and to, to do it during the pandemic is really unbelievable. So it's, I think it's brilliant, it's fantastic. It's, it's another piece of really solid evidence to help us decide how to treat our patients and hopefully improve our patients' outcomes. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to comment. Simon, thanks very much. That was a wonderful and erudite editorial. So we'll go back to Sao Paulo now, and Fernando and Alexandre have the opportunity to reply to Simon's editorial and answer some of the comments and questions that he uh, posted as well. Over to you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, uh, Simon, for the lovely editorial. Thank you very much. So uh, regarding some, some points in the editorial, so uh, regarding the use of the disease database for, for patients with missing data. So that happened for... Uh, Something I don't remember the exact figure, but something around 40 to 50 patients uh, that were enrolled early in the trial. Uh, the National Disease Database has a delay of 18 months. So we could only use data for that for uh, the first few years of the trial. So it was around 40 patients or uh, even less or something like that. Uh, so that's the, that was not, not common. Regarding the, the 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 other the other things, you, you brought up very some very interesting uh, discussions on on this. So uh, I believe that I had the same personal bias for for TBI too, and now that seems to be uh, you know justified now. So it seems that like uh, sodium line should be the go to food for for TBI. Uh, regarding some uh, of the minor points you 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 mentioned, so we decided to adjust the primary endpoint for several variables because. Uh, that perhaps can increase uh, the precision of the fact size estimate. So when this is done a priori, as we did, uh, adjusting the fact size in the clinical trial. So Andrew is here, and and, and I hope we can discuss discuss this further. Uh, usually, increase precision in 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 the fact size estimates for that, in the, in, and that's why we planned to 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 run an adjusted analysis for for the endpoints, and that includes the primary and the secondary endpoints for most of the trials. Uh, regarding the, the missing value imputation, so the concept here was mostly similar, right? So uh, we, we could not have imputed and, and only do a complete case analysis or a worst and, 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 and a best case scenario, for example. 
But uh, my understanding, and please correct Andrew if I'm wrong, is that if you have a large mass of data, it's better to just compute the data and 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 we and not you know slicing things up. So you, you end up losing relevant information because some patients you have information on on how much fluids they received, but not the primary endpoint, etc. So when you impute data, uh, you perhaps you waste less data than you should just uh, remove patients with missing relevant information. And of course, that was a very small uh, percentage of patients. And then I, uh, we, in sensitivity analysis, this did not change the results of the trial in, in, in any way. Uh, regarding the conclusions of the paper uh, on why, why should we use saline if uh, outside TBI. So uh, the main point here, and, and this is something we learned from, from, from basics, is that when you have a very large country, uh, so it, it's not just a matter of cost. So people say, well, plasma light is not much expensive than, than, than saline, and that's true in many scenarios, not, not uh, precisely the case in Brazil. But if you have to move fluids from uh, large distances of land and controlling stock and how to stockpile two different types of fluid, uh, it, it's a little bit more complicated. And especially, you know, because plasma light is not as compatible for dilutions as saline is. So uh, from a populational you know, effect or for a populational level, it's easier for a site that is outside, you know, uh, Sao Paulo or Rio or uh, the center of, of the Southeast and South of Brazil, it's easier for a site to only uh, stock uh, uh, one type of fluid than to stock several different types of fluid and have to consider all the logistics involved. So if one fluid is not harmful and if it's saline is not harmful, why not only using saline and avoiding all the issues with stocking two types of fluid? So that's one thing that we, we, we thought about and I would love to hear what Alexandre thinks about this. Yes, and I agree. And uh, there is really this fact that although for many countries, uh, costs uh, for balanced solutions and saline are similar, this is not the case for many other countries. In Brazil, costs are completely different. Uh, some balanced solutions, as for example, plasma light, can cost many, many, many times the price uh, uh, saline costs. So this makes a difference for, for, for many. Uh, and one other question that I think uh, uh, Simon had is regarding imputed values in table one. Uh, I think Simon, uh, the, the last, last version of the paper, this was changed. Uh, we have uh, published the, the paper that was actually published in, in the JAMA uh, numbers in table one are for the complete case databases without imputed numbers. Then you, again, the number of patients without uh, with missing variables was, was small. And one last comment is regarding the, the question of maintenance fluids. I think the, in, the, in the first day, the, actually the, the volume of, uh, of uh, fluid used as challenging a fluid challenge was much higher than the maintenance and dilution. But then uh, as the days go, as the days go, go by, uh, you can see that uh, the number of maintenance and dilution increase in proportion to the number of fluid challenges. And I think that part of it has to do with the inclusion criteria. To be enrolled, the patient had to be eligible for a fluid challenge. So in the first day, all the patients were supposed to receive a fluid challenge. And finally, there is this thing that uh, if you, even if the, the use of maintenance fluid was maybe small than, smaller than expected, I think it, it really reflects practice here. Uh, use of maintenance fluid is limited in most ICUs uh, here in Brazil. And, um, Nevertheless, the total amount of fluid received in the first three days is similar to other trials and, for example, higher than the use in this March trial. So, yeah, in, in, in the end, uh, we have a lot of uh, fluid challenge in the, in the first days, but then it's decreased to, so that you could see more maintenance and dilution fluids composing the overall amount of fluid used. Thanks, Alessandro. What we'll do now is we will move on to our questions from the audience. We're well behind time, so 
Bronwyn Connolly, my colleague from Queen's University in Belfast, is going to join us. Bronwyn, we'll maybe just have to limit this to three questions, please, and we'll pick up the rest in the podcast that I'll do with Alexandre and Fernando over the next week or two instead. Thanks, Rob. Um, and then there are congratulations to the trial team around uh, the, the delivery of this study from, from the discussions. Um, so I've got one general question and then one for the fluid type and the fluid rate um, components of the study. So, so in general, um, we've touched upon the notion about whether or not this is a, a sick enough group of patients, given the Apache score and the mortality rates, wondering whether there are plans to look at further subgroup analyses around the emergency cohort and excluding the, the um, roughly 50% of patients who are elective surgery. Uh, so, yes, those, those are very great questions, right? So we actually ended up with, with a uh, slightly lower uh, you know, severity than we actually planned before. Uh, so we have some uh, secondary analysis coming on, including excluding elective surgical patients for, for other subgroups, et cetera. So that's, uh, that's coming. Uh, we, we, there was no interaction a priori, and the trial was slightly well-powered to check for interactions between fluid type and, and infusion rate. So uh, this is on the ESM of the paper, so there was no, no interaction. But we have some secondary end analysis coming up for uh, excluding, let's say, less, uh, uh, less severe patients, et cetera. But I would like to, to remind that when you have a look at table one, so uh, and then at the figures uh, for the subgroups, uh, that signal or the absence of a signal there remains absolutely constant or mostly constant in all subgroups except for, for TBI. So I would be surprised if uh, any subgroup would have a very different result than from the major trial. Uh, Alexandre, if you want to comment on that or. No, I agree. I agree with you, Fernando. Um, we have found no, no uh, up to this moment in the uh, severe, severe post hoc sensitivity analysis and subgroup analysis um, evidence of uh, modification of effect in, in, in more severe patients. Uh, another interesting question uh, among patients who received more fluids, of course, this is a post randomization variable, but uh, even considering patients who received more fluids, there was no, no effect of uh, choosing um, a balanced versus saline. Thank you. And then uh, with regard to the fluid type component, um, so many of the patients enrolled into the study had suspected or proven sepsis. And do you think there are other factors such as time to administration of antibiotics and so forth that could have had an impact uh, on, on your findings? Well, talent, yeah, it, 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 it might be related. So we have absolutely no data on that. So uh, and we expected that to be uh, well distributed among the group. So uh, most of the patients were admitted in ICU after initial resuscitation for sepsis. So they also got uh, food bowls in the emergency department or in the operating room before a randomization. So uh, that, that's possible. We are currently working on a secondary analysis checking whether uh, fluid use before enrollment could modify treatment effect for, for the trial. So, uh, but for the other variables, we, we actually, we have no data on that to support either statements. Yeah. And regardless of fluid type, was vasopressor therapy protocolized at all? No. Uh, so th we had no, no protocol for, for vasopressors use or, or vasopressor preferences. So that was, uh, uh, left at the discretion of attending physicians. So some, uh, I can say that the usual practice in Brazil is something, but we don't have data on that. So I would be just providing my opinion and not uh, anything based on data. So we don't know. Yeah. And then the final question around the, the fluid rates, um, what were the clinical or pathophysiological triggers which led to treating clinicians administering fluid boluses? Was, was there a difference in the propensity of clinicians to use higher absolute amounts of fluids according to, to clinical pathological status. So that, that's my greatest regret in basics, perhaps, is not collecting enough data on why food bowls were indicated, right? So we, we provided some guide on that. So we just mentioned that uh, clinicians should consider food bowls on that scenario, but we felt that it wasn't feasible to do a very protocolized trial with such a large sample size. And and we, I, I kind of regret it a little bit to not have enough data on, on, on that. Uh, for, mm, I don't know if there is anything else we want to comment on this, but 
I, I truly, I truly don't believe that uh, the decision to to start for the pressers or not would be a much difference. Let's say so. Uh, when we ran the trial initially, some sites were very, you know, afraid to use a lower infuse rate. So, and we work a lot on uh, engaging sites to adhere to its lower infusion rate. And as time went by and the trial uh, ventured, we saw that most of sites were absolutely okay with his lower infusion rate. So th this was very interesting to see at a site level. Rob, I'll just check in with you before I uh, go to any other questions. No, thanks, Bron. I think we, we better move on, I'm afraid. And we, like I mentioned, we are well behind time. So we'll move on to the panel discussion now. I've already introduced everybody, so we'll just get straight into it. Maybe I'll turn to you, Kath, and hear your initial thoughts about the trial. And I'm sure you ha probably have some questions for the investigators. Thank you. Um, I mean, I'm used to running some difficult trials, but I, I really am um, in awe of this trial, 75 ICUs all following and uh, a, a protocol um, and the sort of the conduct of the trial ticked all the boxes in terms of excellence of conduct. Um, and when you actually looked at the, 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 the thoughts that went behind, so it, designing a trial and getting the design right and the, the whole protocol is really, you have to really, really think about absolutely every aspect. And the, obviously the, the, the PIs had done that because that meant that people could implement it and follow the protocol. So I, I'm uh, very, very, uh, um, as I say, I'm amazed that you were, were able to do this. And especially when the latter part was um, in times of COVID. So yes, absolutely congratulations. In terms of the, the two questions, um, um, in terms of the type of fluid, I don't really have any skin in the game there. Um, and I'm going to let other people comment on that. But um, in uh, also in terms of the, 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 the rates of fluid, um, I, I, I had a couple of questions around that. Obviously, um, I'm I would be very interested in the secondary analysis of what why clinicians decided to give fluid bolus. As I looked at the, the entry criteria, and you could actually be enrolled into the trial purely on an age criteria over 65 alone. Um, uh, but obviously, I, I saw that there's quite a lot of uh, patients who were, were, were admitted with elective surgery. Uh, is it usual that you need fluid boluses after elective surgery, particularly on the first day? So, I mean, I was, I was quite curious about that. Um, but overall, if you actually look at the, the volumes that were given on the first day, um, irrespective of the rates, they were roughly even. So, you know, there was still quite a lot of volume being given overall. So although the rate was slower in the slower arms and they followed that, um, the, the, there was almost about the same amount that was given um, um, between the two, two um, arms. So, um, uh, what else did I, uh, had I picked up? So I did, I did, um, I, I was privileged to be able to have, have this shared with me earlier this week. And so I looked at the, um, the additional, uh, the supplementary uh, data on um, so, so, so the group that I'm very interested, the sepsis group. And I saw that uh, obviously there was no difference in mortality between uh, the two arms and overall it was between 47 and 48%. Is that what would normally be expected? I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there because I know that you're pushed for time. Thank you very much. Yes, first, thanks so much, uh, Catherine, for Professor Catherine, for, for, for the comments and uh, uh, really thanks. Um, regarding the, the amount of fluid, uh, really uh, where the very similar between both slower and faster infusion arms with uh, uh, one hypothesis we had before the results was that uh, maybe for the patients who would receive uh, uh, fluid in a slower rate, maybe the final amount of fluid would be decreased, uh, doctors would stop uh, giving you fluid boluses as the patients would stabilize. Uh, but that was not the case. The, the total amount was really, really uh, similar between groups. Um, we have uh, uh, a lot of those patients, as you say, as you mentioned, uh, coming from the operating room for, from elective surgery. 
Most of those were um, big complex surgeries and this is why patients need ICU. Most surgeries, many surgeries are cardiac surgeries, cardiac surgeries or other um, um, large surgeries. So uh, in this kind of patient, uh, it's very common uh, um, that patients have uh, um, hemodynamic abnormalities such as hypotension and, 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 and other signs of uh, low cardiac output after the surgery. And the physician de- uh, understands that uh, judges that those patients need fluids and give fluid challenges for those patients. So it's very common. Um, and regarding the, the mortality of patients with sepsis, uh, uh, we have, uh, as you mentioned, a 47% mortality. This is, uh, this is um, a, a, a pretty, somewhat higher mortality than many countries. Uh, we have had uh, uh, historically differences among countries in terms of mortality in sepsis. Um, and, and, uh, however, I think... Uh, Part of it has also to do with the eligibility criteria of the study when we consider the, the, re- the set of risk factors that patients had. Uh, we, we knew that those patients that are eligible that have these risk factors would have a higher mortality than, than those who, who do not have. So these, I think, are a special subset of patients with sepsis and other critically ill patients. So maybe it's, it helps explain the, the higher mortality in the subgroup. Thanks, Alexandre. We'll cross to Copenhagen and Tina, your thoughts on the trial, please. Thanks, Rob. I'm very humbled to be part of this panel and uh, Fernando, Alexandre, just many, many congratulations on this trial. It's um, extremely large and also individually randomized, uh, robust trial answering a relevant uh, clinical question. So I'm I'm very impressed. And then overall, uh, general first thought is also that I'm, I'm actually excited to see all of these aspects of, of fluid therapy on the research agenda. Um, they, are, they are being taken very seriously, discussed, and also prioritized into high quality trials like uh, basics. So I think that, that certainly helps us improve therapy. Um, I'll also, um, I'll try not to repeat any of the other comments and I'll also go to the, the, the speed uh, part of the, the trial. Um, so I'll get in line with Simon and, and your conclusion was that, that these data do not support a slower infusion rate. And I get that this was also your intervention. So obviously it, it was phrased like this, but um, I'll get in line with Simon's comment that, that equally to me, they do not support a faster uh, infusion rate. Um, so first uh, comment or question could be, um, if you're in a, if you're in a, res- uh, ICU setting and not routinely using infusion pumps, which was used in in basics. But this also just support that you do not need to go on and and do that for for your, invest in those for your your ICU patients. You can go ahead with slower infusion rates. Um, And a second comment could be um, regarding the the differing SOFA scores on day three, um, the patients in in the lower infusion rates had lower, uh, at least cardiovascular and respiratory uh, SOFA scores. Could this, do you think it's a, f- you mentioned several secondary outcomes, so obviously we have to be cautious, but could it be in line with some of the potential paradoxical effects of a fluid bolus that we've seen in, in FEAST and also in Ben Andrews' uh, sepsis studies from, from Zambia? Or do you think we should not pay much attention to them if if the, down the line, patient importance outcomes uh, do not differ. Oh, those, those are great comments. So, of course, I, I, I'm, I'm very fond of the, the infusion uh, rate uh, part of the trial because that was something that we, I'm very fond of it. And, and of course, that was inspired by Dr. Maitland's uh, fee study. So that was where it all started. So, of course, if you have a look at the secondary endpoints, and I know there are secondary endpoints and merely exploratory, they all follow the, 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 the logical reasoning we had behind, right? So, uh, if you give less food bowls, perhaps you have, uh, you, you do not have the harmful effect of lowering our arterial elastance, perhaps to reduce lung edema, uh, 
uh, etc. So that's in line with physiological reasoning, right? But of course, we have to be very careful not to, to extrapolate physiological reasoning from uh, patient-centered endpoints, and we have to be very modest on that. But of course, I, I, I truly believe that that's something that we, we should discuss. And especially for the first part of what you said, uh, many sites uh, before basics did not use infusion pumps for uh, in fluid challenges, right? So it was common practice in Brazil to run 500 ml at any speed you can, just wide open. And wide open can be anything for from 20 minutes to three hours, right? Because it depends on venous access, et cetera. So when we protocolized that, that was a very that was a quality improvement for sites, and some sites were very happy to do that. But I, I believe that what basics can say is that uh, for patient center endpoints, infusion speed, at least infusion speeds we tested uh, for patients that were already resuscitated in the emergency department, doesn't seem to make much of an effect. If it does, we have to explore that a little bit better, and perhaps we should still work on that and do some secondary analysis, and perhaps run other trials on that to understand further whether that translates to other relevant endpoints. But that, that, that's my favorite question of the trial, because uh, and that's very interesting to see the secondary results. And so we, by the way, I have to, we had to keep a lower tone on that because a lot of secondary, et cetera. Great, thanks. We'll cross to Pittsburgh and we'll go to Chris first. Chris, as um, an associate editor at JAMA, you no doubt have seen this paper for a period of time. Perhaps you could give us your opinion and also maybe some of the comments that were made as this was reviewed as it went through JAMA. Great, uh, so hopefully everyone can hear me and thank you for the opportunity to join the panel. Um, there's not enough superlatives, right, for these papers, uh, and I would be repeating those that others have shared, but of course, congratulations. Uh, this is quite the, uh, the duet. Um, and that, uh, wearing the, the JAMA hat for, for the first few comments here, um, you know, there wasn't necessarily a question, right, of whether this data and the quality of this trial uh, uh, was going to land in our pages, but rather how how to present that for the reader. Was this one manuscript? Was this two? Um, were these questions truly scientifically separate? Certainly, we had the absence of the interaction, and so that uh, gave us a little bit of a foundation there to make these two separate pieces. Um, in the end, uh, uh, you know, we had uh, Professor Cooper Smith write a fantastic editorial that uh, should also be released today, um, and I think. Uh, I think we were excited to get this data. Um, uh, the BrickNet has been producing fantastic and rigorous trials that are very large uh, now for a number of years. Um, as a as a clinician, um, I'm also also struck uh, by uh, this fantastic work, um, and can only imagine the critique from others might be, "Well, you didn't answer the question I wanted you to ask, right?" Um, because the clinical moment of deciding how to administer fluids is, is so different depending on where you are in the hospital, what phase you are in your intensive care, uh, and even of course, what country you're in. Um, so, so that's what I'm struck by. As I listen to this amazing presentation uh, with important data that we'll be analyzing for years is there are so many other clinical moments uh, we could test. Not only do we have an average treatment effect across uh, the patients, but the, the the trial design averages the clinical moments across their stay and says, we're just going to implement one strategy for all moments. Um, it makes us think about the AI clinician and what Komarowski's group is doing as ways to sort of find these individual uh, treatment effects. Um, so uh, all told, this is fantastic work. We were so excited uh, to get this and to partner uh, with Group Care Reviews and everyone here uh, to release this data today. So thanks. Thanks, Chris. Pleasure. We're going to cross town to the other side of Pittsburgh and to Andrew Oldhouse, our expert statistician and methodologist. Andrew, you've had a chance to look at this. How does the statistical plan and the execution of it look to you? It looks, to my amateur eye, very robust. We've had some comments already made by Simon during his editorial. Perhaps you could touch on some of those and, and give us your overall feeling for this. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Rob. And, and again, congratulations to the team, you know, and glad to uh, to have had the opportunity to contribute here. Uh, I mean, I would agree uh, with your comments, Rob. This is very a robust sized trial. Uh, you know, I think it's rare that we get trials uh, of this magnitude in the ICU, although we're starting to see more and more of them, thanks to some really great efforts around the world. 
Uh, I think it had a very sound uh, and very transparent statistical analysis plan. Uh, you know, I certainly applaud the authors for, for publishing their statistical analysis plan, being very, very clear about what they intended to do. Uh, I guess there's been two, two comments about the statistical analyses uh, thus far that are worth addressing. Um, uh, the first about the imputation. Uh, so practically, <laughs> For the reader here, I think the key takeaway is that there was actually so little missing data that I, I can't imagine this made much of an impact one way or the other. And I mean, that's thanks to the incredible system the trial team put in place to make sure that they had uh, fairly complete outcome data. I think it was, you know, on the order of, of, you know, no more than a few dozen people that would have been missing primary outcomes data that had to be imputed. So. Uh, that does not trouble me very much because I, I just think that there was so little missing outcome data that it would have made very little effect. Although I do agree that imputation is generally preferred to a complete case analysis because of the concern that uh, uh, some sort of bias could be introduced depending on the mechanism of missingness, but, but there's just so little missingness here. I, I just doubt that it would have made much difference. I think the more interesting comment uh, that came up that maybe I can, can bring a little punch is the question about uh, using an adjusted survival analysis as opposed to an unadjusted analysis. And the, the truth is, again, these results, because the trial is so large and, and so robust and the results are sort of what they are, I doubt this would have made much difference either. But I will say that uh, it's probably somewhat of a little appreciated fact that you do gain something in your analysis uh, by adjusting for a few baseline variables. Uh, and that's actually true, even if they are balanced between the groups. I think often there's this belief, oh, it's a randomized trial, so you're guaranteed you're guaranteed balanced groups, why would you need to adjust for any variables? Uh, but when you adjust for, for something that is associated with the study outcome by explaining a little bit of that outcome variation, you actually end up getting a little bit more precise estimate of the treatment effect, which can increase your power to detect the difference uh, if there is one present. So uh, I, you know, I, I actually applaud the authors for, for doing that. Uh, it's something I'd like to see used uh, a bit more uh, in randomized trials. Though I will concede the point that, uh, again here, it probably, because the trial is fairly large and robust, would not have made a great deal of difference um, one way or the other. Uh, I guess my last point that, that I'd uh, bring here, you know, I think we always have to be careful uh, ever kind of saying that we've proven that there's no difference or, or, or uh, anything like that on a negative, so-called negative trial, because we, we, we know or we should know that uh, the absence of evidence is not always necessarily the same thing as proving uh, that there is no effect. Uh, but with the, the large sample size we had here, the, the, uh, uh, the resultant uh, precise, you know, fairly tight confidence intervals on the treatment effect in, in the two trials, uh, it certainly suggests that um, sort of on that broad scale, whatever effect may exist uh, of the, within the type of fluid or between a faster versus slower infusion, uh, at least in this, this type of patient group and in this setting, seems likely to be small. And I, I love that point that, that was made by a couple of our panelists, or, which is being mindful of the local context, thinking about things like, is there a difference in cost of these fluids in, in a location, or is it easier to deliver a faster or slower in, uh, infusion in a certain location? So I think this data is, is great because it suggests that at least in, in some settings, the, the, the difference is likely to be fairly small or perhaps trivial. Uh, and in some ways, maybe that's reassuring that whichever you do, it's probably OK. Can I jump in, Rob? Yeah, of course, Simon. I, um, I mean, I think Chris raises, you know, an, some interesting point because, um, you know, around this, this whole issue about how we have these very different time points um, and what we're studying and what base, basics studied and what PLUS is studying is does the selection of a type of fluid in the ICU influence patient's outcome? Because obviously we're working in ICUs and we're deciding what fluids to give patients um, and that's kind of ignoring what's gone before and, and what's going after and we're at, we're at different time points. Although I think one of the things I looked at in SMART because they, they did their electronic health record for all their data collection, they actually had a record, and I think this is a particularly US kind of centric thing that they actually knew all the fluid that someone was given throughout their entire hospital stay without having to go away and collect it on bits of paper. 
Um, and, and, and basically for the, in that trial, the patients who'd gone through the ICU, two thirds of the fluid they received during their entire hospital stay was in the ICU. So you'd expect that that would have, have some impact. But I, I, I think, you know, we can't get away from, from COVID. And I think it, to me, COVID, you know, with recovery and remap cap and all, and, and all these adaptive trials with, with, with stopping rules that we've all kind of shied away from in the past and adapting, um, you know, that, that, that maybe that's a more efficient way for us to do research. I mean, I've been very much in the Gordon Guyatt camp of thinking we shouldn't stop trials ever. But in reality, the, 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 the resources required to, to do these trials and there, there are so many questions. So I'm wondering, I mean, I'm wondering if, you know, maybe the landscape's changed and maybe we're going to, to have to think a bit more about efficiency. I mean, our government has spent so much money on COVID. I mean, they're trying to get everybody tested every other day and goodness knows how much, you know, running up you know, billions, trillions of dollars, like most governments around the world in, in debt. Um, and that's impacting their funding of research. You know, the, there's cutting back on, you know, there's not enough money. We're spending it all. We're giving it all to the vaccine makers and to the people who run tests. And they've, it is actually impacting on research. So I'm wondering whether we need to change our mindset a bit about that. And I'd be very interested if Bronwyn's, maybe people can tell Bronwyn or through, through Twitter or whatever means, what, what are the questions that people actually w- want more questions we want answered about fluids? I mean, there's some good, clearly there's a lot of interest in whether we should be using vasopressors earlier. We do that anyway, but I think, you know, should my thoughts around maybe we need to think a bit, you know, maybe the 11,000 patient trial is phenomenal, fantastic. But maybe if you've been doing using futility boundaries, you'd have stopped um, earlier and, and, and then taken those resources somewhere else. Just some thoughts. Fantastic. Thanks, Simon. We'll try and magnify that comment and send it out, uh, certainly ac- across Twitter. Um, I'm going to turn to both Kath and Tina. Uh, Kath's feast work showed previously that fluid therapy, certainly in febrile African children um, who were shocked, um, worsened outcome. Tina's classic program is looking at a restrictive fluid regime. I would have thought that the slower fluid infusion rate would have chimed with both programs. Perhaps I could get your thoughts on that. Um, so um, the trial that we did was obviously in children. I probably don't need to explain it. I think most of the audience may may, may be familiar with it. But um, we literally um, gave a, a homeopathic dose of fluid, which caused harm at uh, 20 mils per kilo, whereas um, many of the guidelines were recommending far, far more fluid. And, and yet that caused harm. And the harm we started to see within hours it's um, of them receiving fluid, it, the harm was early, but it was also, uh, it, it, it had, because we followed the children up um, for um, up to about a hundred hours after they received that, that single, largely single bolus, um, that the, 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 the curves did not come back to get together. So they, so they weren't able to, to, to get better uh, faster. So that was very surprising and so, I think it was, it, it's not just the rate, but it's also the volume um, and overall um, the rest, you know, all the other sort of fluids that they were given were relatively modest um, compared to that. So I, um, there, there was a, an, an ovine model of this feast, feast in sheep by uh, John Fraser's group in uh, Brisbane. And they also showed uh, that actually troponins went through the roof once they um, gave uh, fluid boluses. I, I know that's in sheep and not humans, but it, and it's, a, it's an endotoxin model. But again, that, it, that was early, about around about eight hours after they started the, uh, the saline bolus. So it's, it, I think there's still more questions that we need to uh, um, ask um, around uh, volume of fluid. Thank you. 
Um, I'll just I'll just join on that. And I was actually thinking of that Ovine uh, model as well. Um, and we also saw in the classic feasibility trial at that time it was conducted, it was expected that that the patient uh, the patients randomized to the restrictive strategy would have a, a way higher noradrenaline requirement. And in a in a post hoc analysis, they had the same noradrenaline requirement as the uh, as the liberal group. So I, I, st I still wonder if this could be in line with some paradoxical hemodynamic response, maybe also seen in basic. I'm I'm not sure. We I think we know way too little about this um, initial hemodynamic response of a of a fluid bolus. Um, in terms of the population, the in in the in the classic trial, we'll expect well they are adults with septic shock, so they 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 differ from the population in basics. We'll expect them to have received both prior to randomization uh, quite a lot more fluids uh, going into the trial, and also during the first days of, of randomization, um, received quite a lot a lot more both of of, of boluses and also uh, I guess maintenance fluids uh, in the setting that we we're conducting them. Fernando and Alexandre, can I ask, have you had the opportunity to undertake any mechanistic studies um, to look at how fast or slow infusion rates could either cause benefit or harm relative to the other group? Yeah, so uh, we, we had uh, one uh, sub-study that was led by Flavia Machado uh, that was in a, in a subsample of 100 20 patients or something uh, in, in the basics trial where we have uh, somewhat detailed hemodynamic values uh, before and after food suspension. Uh, we are, are yet to analyze these data, so we do not have data on that to, to present. But uh, overall, uh, I believe that the questions that were posed and, 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 and the question is, why are we still doing food bowls, right? So, uh, and, and somehow we know from a long time that food bowls have a very short half-life there is a paper by Flavia too, where I you know the duration of the hemodynamic benefits of free bowls is limited to half an hour or so. And perhaps that comes at the cost of increasing vasopressors or uh, causing more tissue edema and organ failure. So I totally agree with what Professor Le Maitland and, 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 and team said regarding food bowls. So it's, it's time to reconsider why we are doing food bowls and uh, not only the speed, but the volume, the time of using fluid, et cetera. So, it's time to uh, reassess everything again and start doing the same mistake. So uh, I would love to have done something similar to feast in adults, but of course it would be very hard to, to get people to randomize a, a very large number of patients. Uh, even the slower infusion speed was not very well received, you can imagine, because people were afraid that we were not going to correct uh, the cardiac output and the blood pressure as fast as we could, and that's harmful for patients. Etc. So if I had to give a, a step further, that would be do not give free bowls or something like that. Uh, that would not be well received. So uh, I believe that basics was somehow an intermediate step between uh, that was just now we can say that perhaps it's, it's reasonable to, to think that uh, giving fluids lower is actually safe. So there is no rush to use a very fast infusion rate or something. And now we can cool down and perhaps reconsider whether we should or not give fluid bowls and not say that we have a very narrow window to give that amount of fluids, et cetera. So uh, if, if, if that's it, the legacy of basics, I, I would be truly happy and that, that's enough for the trial, you know. Thanks, Fernando. Chris, can I ask, where do you think this question goes next? The most obvious example I can think of is the Clovers trial, where we're looking at less fluid and early vasopressor um, is there anything else that you can think of or where do you think the next step in this field is? Uh, yeah, that's, um, that's a broad question. I think you could ask um, all of us on the panel, we might give you a different answer, to be honest, uh, which, which probably speaks to the number of unknowns. Uh, so yes, I'm, I'm excited to see results of Clovers as well. So as, as some know, Clovers is a trial uh, funded by the NHLBI. Uh, as part of the pedal network, testing different uh, fluid and vasopressor combinations, um, looking to give a smaller fluid bolus size with an earlier initiation of uh, vasopressors, uh, similar, uh, although not um, exactly the same as the classic program. And so, um, yeah, I think that's an exciting future direction. I mean, when the trial controls uh, the type of fluid and the pace, what's not controlled, again, is the clinical moment at which uh, 
I mean, what's left open are the other times. Is this in the ED? Is this later? Is the dose altogether? And then, of course, the target. What is what are the clinicians administering their fluid to? Uh, and is that also uh, an open question? Um, I think Simon brings up uh, a, a fantastic idea. Why not have a remap for all of it, uh, where we have domains and arms uh, that are incorporating all of these together? Um, the complexity of a trial like that uh, is daunting, um, but the alternative is perhaps doing one trial after another after another over many, many, many years. Thanks, Chris. Um, well, have you got time for another quick comment from me, Rob? Of, of course. If we look at, I mean, one of the things, and again, Chris touched on it there, what, what is our target? And I think that's really where our challenge is, is that we have, I mean, I'm so old that I remember, and none of my junior colleagues remember, see this now, people on ventilators with three chest tubes in each side because they'd had their lungs blown apart by, by us, you know, people trying to normalize CO2 because that was what we were taught we ought to do and and if you look at ARDS you know ARDS net low tidal volume which basically said that it's better to you know the, the minute ventilation was the same so it's better to have lots of small breaths than to have a few large breaths if you want to really simplify it but nursing staff don't like that they don't like patients who are breathing very fast and and looking upset and they don't like tachycardic patients and they don't like patients who, who look like they're a little bit hypovolemic. And that, I think, drives a lot of, of practice. And we know ARDSnet, even in the hospitals that conducted the study, you know, they didn't practice low tidal volume ventilation when it was looked at afterwards. So, so I think the, the, one of the, the, that question about what are our targets, and if we know our targets which I think we do pretty well in, in, you know, the ARDS and the low tidal volume stuff is pretty convincing and compelling, but people don't do it. Um, how do we then translate if, for instance, Classic and Clovers and there's a, a RISE fluids program in Australia, which is going to start with a low, low, less fluid, more vasopressor in the emergency department for sepsis, so right, right at the front door. Um, if those things do suggest that we should be practicing differently, um, a lot of trying to change that into patient, improve patient's outcome is going to involve re-educating, certainly in my country, the entire critical care nursing population, that what they currently view as a patient who looks untidy and unwell and they haven't got nice straight lines on the monitor is is actually fixing those things is actually harming the patients so i think that question of what is our targets is a really important one thanks simon um, andrew i want to bring you in on a, a kind of a methods point um, simon highlighted in his editorial that balanced solutions that were led to a worse outcome in those who are associated with a worse outcome in those who receive balanced solutions. There were 18 or 19 secondary outcomes which were considered exploratory. This was a tertiary or a subgroup outcome. As a methodologist, what, how much value do we put on this um, result? Clearly, Simon's SAFE trial from oh, 18 years ago maybe demonstrated harm with albumin in traumatic brain injury as opposed to um, saline in a subgroup. So he has that in his head to um, think about when looking at these results. But as a statistician, perhaps somewhat separate from a clinical ICU background, how would you view that? Yeah, boy, this is always one of the hardest things I think to look at with trial results, because on one hand, you say we've got all this data and we want to learn as much as possible from the trial. You know, it seems silly almost to say, well, we're just going to look at one outcome or we're just going to look at two outcomes. We should look at a lot of things to try to understand what happened to these patients and whether it be subgroup analyses or just looking at secondary and tertiary outcomes to understand if there's other things maybe that we didn't expect or, or that have clinical relevance, you know, um, so on one hand, they say, great, we want to learn as much as we can from the trial. On the other hand, uh, I think as, as most of our folks probably know, the number of statistical tests that you do without any sort of correction for the fact that you're doing more statistical text, tests 
does bring increase the possibility that one or two of them will I, I hate to say look positive by chance, but I think that's the term that, that resonates with most people. You, you know, I, I always joke, if you stand there flipping a coin all day, at some point you're gonna get four or five heads in a row. And that doesn't mean that the coin was suddenly unfair at that time, it just means you stood there flipping a coin all day. The same kind of thing happens when you do a lot of statistical tests. So I think with secondary outcomes, they're generally best viewed as some combination of confirmatory and and exploratory you, you know maybe they 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 bolster your confidence uh in the primary outcome if they're kind of going the same direction as the primary outcome uh in some cases maybe they go in the other direction but you have a sense of why that would happen like you know that the treatment might get you a benefit in one regard but potentially have a, a, a possible harm or, or side effect in in another regard Statistically, there's no great answer to this for me, because in one respect, at a very rigid side, you say you should just correct for all of the multiple comparisons you do. You know, you take some sort of penalty, a statistical penalty, and you adjust all of your, your comparisons to try to make sure that you don't increase the overall risk of, of any sort of false positive result. But on the other hand, that's, that's actually very, very harsh. That makes it very hard for almost any finding <laughs> to become significant particular lot of, of secondary outcomes or subgroup analyses that you're looking at. So I think there's no easy answer to this. I think it has to be this um, combination of plausibility of understanding. Is there other prior evidence or, or evidence from this trial that, that makes that that says why we might see a particular out there effect in a certain subgroup or in a second uh, secondary outcome? Um, but it's 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 really, really tough, Rob. There's no great answer to that. I wish I could have given a more satisfactory answer, but I, the truth is I don't have one. Fantastic, Andrew. Yep. It's a it's a hard question. Um, we're over time. What I'm gonna do is quickly go around our panelists and just ask each person the same question. What is this going to do to your practice tomorrow morning? Kath, can I maybe start with you in Kenya? Uh, well, not much actually, <laughs> but it, but it's in terms of as I said, there's no skin in the game in terms of types of fluid because the the, the, the plasma light is not available here. But in terms of uh, 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 rates of fluid um, and overall volume, I think we've already hopefully addressed that question. Sadly, a lot of people are still wedded to fluid boluses um, um, in Africa. Um, uh, pediatricians are. Um, I just keep on trying to get the message out there. But I, yeah, just congratulations uh, for a fantastic trial. And I think it's the, in terms of, uh, it's a step forward in terms of moving the, the goal towards saying, well, yes, we can give slower infusion rates um, it, safely um, to the next question. Um, and I think that allows you to ask the next question. Fantastic, thanks, Kath. So Tina, just um, very quickly, so plasma light is also not routinely used in in Denmark. Um, so so that part wouldn't change practice a lot. And and um, I would uh, I would I would be safely using the the slow infusion rate. Um, but I wouldn't worry too much about either or um, from these data. And Chris. Yeah, so I think in the U.S. Um, and frankly, even myself have been enamored with the uh, the trials from the Vanderbilt group. Um, I'll probably be using more uh, saline than I had uh, six months ago, uh, with a little bit more of an open mind to equipoise. Yeah, and I think as a as a clinician, I might maybe use a little bit more saline as well, which I wouldn't have thought of saying before uh, these trial results. Um, Andrew, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe not ask you that question. It might be a, a touch unfair. So we'll finish um, the panel discussion just with a quick comment from Alexandre and Fernando, and then we'll move into Fernando's last talk. So just a quick comment, uh, gents, please. I'd like to, to thank everyone for, for the excellent uh, discussion, and uh, um, we're happy that uh, the results may be contributing somehow to, to the decision regarding the, the best choice of fluids. And uh, um, I think uh, this was a, a large study. Uh, uh, Simon commented before that maybe we might have uh, stopped it earlier because of utility. On the other hand, um, as this is the most commonly used drug uh, for first for critical ill patients, I think even a small difference would count. So I think uh, even if the data is negative for this study, the possibility that we have to have 
other studies and, and to analyze other databases together with Plus and, and, and Smart and other trials uh, will be super helpful. And uh, um, yes, I think uh, we, we have, uh, we are have very pleased to have had the opportunity to contribute with this, this data for, for the care of critical ill patients. So yeah, thanks. Okay. Um from me, thanks very much to our panel. We're way over time. If I had a boss, I'd be fired, but I don't. So I'm not. <laughs> we'll move on now to Fernando's final talk. It's a brief Thanks. talk, the learnings from basics. Clearly, this was a huge, huge trial, and there will be lots uh, of learnings for other trialists out there to glean from this talk. So Fernando, back to you. Oh, this is just uh, most of the comments uh, here are, were already uh, addressed. So just to make uh, some formal uh, final comments. So I'd just like to uh, reinforce that uh, the benefits of the clinical trial far exceed the research question, right? So uh, sites, we improve, improve their registry in fluid balance, uh, basis created jobs, right? So some uh, research staff and data collectors were employed because we were able to refund uh, the, the sites for reimburse the sites for the, their work. Uh, this trial happened to consolidate the BrickNet as a very large uh, research network. And of course, the, 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 the money that we gave to the site, the reimbursement rates, were, was used to uh, several questions from sponsoring young physicians and young nurses to go to congresses, to buying ultrasound machines, etc. And we are very proud that we did that. Uh, I, I don't regret a lot of things. So I don't re regret doing a very large trial. I don't regret doing a pragmatic but not sloppy design. I don't uh, regret using nine-day mortality as a primary endpoint because if I did the composite endpoint, people would say, well, it's a composite endpoint. Uh, if we did renal replacement therapy, but it was positive for renal replacement therapy, but negative for mortality, uh, people would say, well, but it does not change mortality. So uh, what's, what's the point? So. Uh, Mortality is pretty much straightforward and it's still very straightforward. Uh, and I don't regret uh, pre-planning an EPDMA with uh, other trials. And I don't uh, regret uh, all the work that sites had for using fluids for treating challenges, maintenance and dilutions. There are some things that I could, perhaps we could have done differently, right? So uh, we, looking in retrospect, we, we had a different rationales and different uh, concepts for the two interventions. And uh, it, it might seem that perhaps we could have considered different endpoints for some secondary analysis. Uh, I also regret, uh, partially regret, uh, using some secondary endpoints, including SOFOSCORE and using KDGO. Uh, we have data on, 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 on urinary output too that probably didn't add much. Uh, so perhaps, and we failed at least in the main analysis to consider all the time dependencies and the competing risks for these endpoints, right? So uh, we amended that with some secondary uh, pause uh, analysis that are on the paper, but perhaps we should have thought a little bit more about this. Uh, perhaps we should also have collected a little bit more data on some aspects like, you know, type of surgery, uh, the ICP values and TBI, for example, uh, I regret not collecting data on why the food challenges were, were, were performed. So uh, overall, uh, of course, it's, it's easy to, to say everything uh, afterwards when the trial is completed. Uh, but uh, most of all, I believe that we could have uh, worked a little bit more in the infusion rate study or considering other different analysis. So uh, if I may, so... I don't think we should abandon mortality as an endpoint uh, when this data is actually needed to change practice, right? So uh, if it was, if this trial was positive for plasma light or whatever, uh, results will be, well, it's very easy to, to make clinicians understand effect size when the endpoint is mortality, right? Uh, on the other hand, as, as it was said by many, we did not consider uh, the patient journey inside the hospital, right? So this was a point that was very well made by all the panelists. So perhaps we should have considered the patients from admission to discharge. And of course, we are just working on a, a small time frame. And finally, uh, the, the only thing that perhaps we can discuss, when BASICS was designed, so this was the standard, right? So BASICS is a very traditional trial in the sense that there are no adaptive rules, so it's not a Bayesian trial. 
uh, we do not have uh, different endpoints that require some more advanced modeling. But of course, perhaps uh, for future trials, some different endpoints like you know, days alive and free off, which can be assessed in several ways, either frequentists or Bayesians, uh, could be a very uh, interesting endpoint because it can bind, you know, mortality with need for organ support. So that would be interesting. Uh, and perhaps win ratio with uh, uh, comes from the cardiology field is something that perhaps we should work a little bit more uh, in, in critical care. Uh, we are going to running a secondary analysis of basics winning using the win ratio. And perhaps uh, other studies should consider one of these approaches to maximize power or to maximize finding a difference in, in and provide clinically meaningful uh, endpoints. So that was it. It was just some very quick comments here. Thank you.